again. Okay, welcome ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm Ian Charles and I am your host uh, come MC for this event. Uh, the most important thing that I'm going to ask you to do is put money in this jar. Um, this is the prize money for the event. We've got about, well, I'm going to say, we've got about 150 bucks in here already. Um, the suggested donation is uh, $5. And um, I'm going to mercilessly point out anyone who doesn't put their hand in their pocket. <laughs> Good lad. Please pass it round. Um, first order of business is really to introduce our judges. And um, going from the far left, we have Mr. Dave Gregorka from Baird Capital. He is an experienced venture capitalist, and he is the nice member of the panel. <laughs> um, in the middle, we have from uh, Tech Town, Charlie Moret. Uh, Charlie also has a background in investing in businesses. At the moment, he is... Um, what, what would you say you do? You kind of help entrepreneurs. I, I kind of prefer to listen to you explain what I do. <laughs> okay, so, so Charlie <laughs> is nice to entrepreneurs for a living, so he's going to make the most of this opportunity to be really mean. <laughs> and um, finally, we have Martin Dober. Uh, that's a good German name. Uh, you might know the breed of dog, Doberman, which means eats people. <laughs> <laughs> Or pinches. So, um, what have I got to do next? Well, the first thing I've got to do is introduce our first contestant. Uh, Xavier, where are you? I saw, come on up. Okay, Xavier. You can do it, I guess. You can either use this or stand behind a podium. So, Helen, are you going to do the timing? Okay. When you're ready. Hi, my name is Xavier Clemens, and I'm the inventor of the all-new revolutionary shaving device that's shaped like a credit card. There are many benefits of the new credit card shaver over your traditional disposable razor. One, the new credit card shaver shaves more area. Since the late 19th century, when the safety razor first started receiving patents, it basically was designed to shave between one and about one-eighth of an inch. Today, in the 20th century, over 100 years later, the disposable razor, no matter which one you buy, still shaves between one and about one-eighth of an inch. I want to tell you, the new credit card shaver shaves a whopping two inches, creating less work, creating less time. How will I produce the new credit card shaver to the world? By licensing out my own manufacturing plant here in the United States. Why here in the United States and not overseas? Because here in the United States is where I want to be in. Here in the United States is where I feel companies can win. And most importantly, here in the United States is where I believe in. I believe in the country in which I live. Two. I want to manufacture the first biodegradable disposable shaver here in the United States. Plastic waste continues to be one of our major contaminants. With the new credit card shaver, I will be using a type of plastic called polylactic acid, which can break down much easier when heated to 140 degrees in a compost facility. Let us all do our part to not only make this world a cleaner place, but a safer place. Three, if you're one of the over 2.5 billion travelers who frequently fly the friendly skies, put your mind at ease and take the credit card shaver along with you through any airport because it is TSA approved. 
And finally, men, it fits easily and conveniently in your wallet. Ladies, write in your little tiny makeup kit so you'll be ready for that shave night or day, work and play. So judges, audience, partner with me and watch as the new credit card shaver takes the world by storm, one hair at a time. Thank you. All right. I think I might have a few more seconds left. Um, I just want to say that 1.8 billion men shave. Um, they start shaving at around age 15. Women shave around 12 times a month and over 7,700 times in their lifetime. And lastly, the shaving industry is forecast to top over $33 billion by the year 2015. And to date, every expectation has been met or exceeded. Thank you. All right. So I didn't realize women shave that often. But with three daughters, that's why I can never find a razor in my house. Okay, gentlemen, have at it. Dave, what have you got to say? Uh, I think, you know, very interesting uh, presentation, Xavier. Um, I'm uh, uh, just wondering a couple of things about, uh, you know, what's going to make people rush out and, and buy this product over, you know, what they're usually buying today. You know, what's, what's the compelling thing other than maybe putting it in your wallet or getting through TSA? What are some of the advantage of it? Uh, other advantages, I think that would be useful. Um, I think probably um, Ian and Martin could speak to this product more than I can. I think they, they both uh, did a lot of shaving this morning. Uh, <laughs> they give me a little flack. Um, so um, what do you guys think? I mean, yeah, I, yeah, for someone like me, you never know when you're going to need to shave. So, uh, yeah, I'd like to carry one around with me all the time. <laughs> um, no, I guess uh, I'd like to hear some more, um, actually, about the advantages as well. And, and again, and the other thing is, you know, how... How you'd plan to distribute this uh, this product, and uh, and and actually, and the other thing I would have liked to have heard is a little bit about about your background, Xavier, and um, and uh, you know what's uh, you know what experience you have in taking a product like this to market. So those are things I would have liked to have heard. But I like the energy of the presentation; really, really good. Yeah, I thought you engaged the audience very quickly in terms of your energy coming through. I think some of the questions that came to mind was like if, if it's a bigger shaver and it's two inches versus, I don't know, one and a half, so that, if that saves me like three seconds uh, each day, then how much time do I pick up during the course of the year, which would be helpful for me because, you know, if I picked up maybe another 45 minutes a year, that would give me a lot of extra time to do things. Um, also, I was curious, you know, uh, you know if, if it works on the hair, you know, I think, you know, on the head, that would be really, you know, really good. But I, then I immediately thought, well, can you also use it to shave the hair on your ears? Um, or, you know, if, if you use it, can your wife then use it on her legs, you know? So what's the durability of it? But... Uh, um, and I guess the only other thing that I was sort of thinking about, flying the friendly skies and the TSA approved and all that, and then something about the temperature. I wasn't really clear. So if you had the shaver in your pocket, in your wallet, and you were driving through Death Valley, would it melt and sort of secure your wallet together? So, you know, I think things like this that are really critical to understand in the product would have been most helpful. You really were looking forward to that, weren't you? I mean, I can tell. <laughs> All right, gentlemen, do your scores, and um, we will get for the next victim. And our next victim is Diana Chen, who has wisely brought lots of friends along. Whenever you're ready. Hi, everybody. How's it going? My name is Diana Chen, and I'm the founder of Law Studio. When I started law school a few years ago, I knew that I would be working alongside some of the brightest and most honorable individuals. I thought that I would be able to use my creativity and entrepreneurial drive to become a business lawyer and help entrepreneurs grow their businesses in cost-effective and efficient ways. 
Unfortunately, I soon realized that my initial perceptions of the legal field may have been a little naive. As I went through law school and saw the inner workings of a law firm, I was a little disappointed to find that not only were law firms severely lagging in their use of technology, but their entire way of thinking and doing things was backwards and outdated. Rather than helping entrepreneurs grow their businesses, lawyers were instead creating a hindrance to business growth with their high costs and low efficiency. That's why I created Law Studio, the first and only online crowdsourcing platform for startups and small businesses to find affordable legal help. We allow businesses to post their requests for legal work online and lawyers to bid on those services through a closed bidding system. Each lawyer will have an online profile that includes their areas of expertise, certifications, licenses, education, and past practice, similar to a LinkedIn profile. On top of that, each profile will also feature a client rating similar to what Yelp uses so that users can see whether past clients have enjoyed working with that attorney. Based on all of this information, the client is well equipped to make an informed decision about which attorney to hire. Once a client hires an attorney, all transactions take place through our online platform. We allow businesses to we allow lawyers to bid on the businesses, which in turn allows us to present clients with the lowest market rates and expose them to a wide array of talented attorneys that they might not otherwise come across. We are different from any other legal services platform out there. We've taken a basic crowdsourcing model, which has gained substantial popularity in certain fields such as graphic design and freelance writing, and applied it to professional services. The legal market is rapidly shifting from large corporations with a ton of resources to small businesses and startups with very little capital, but a huge interest in efficiency and innovation. The legal field needs to keep up with the changing market, and in order to do so, lawyers need to shift away from their old, traditional, outdated ways of thinking and doing things and move into a new model of thinking that focuses on efficiency and innovation through the use of technology. That's what we have set out to do at Law Studio. We're here to reinvent the legal system, and we hope you'll join us. Thank you. All right. Yes, I was, uh, I was really hoping it was going to be something useful to do with lawyers, like turn them into soap. Uh, <laughs> but, but you can't have everything, can you? Um, gentlemen, we'll go the other way around. Mr. Dover. Well, I, um, I really liked your presentation. I thought you did a really nice job, covered a lot during it. Uh, um, and, uh, you know, I guess some of the things I would have liked to hear um, more about would be, um, you know, first of all, um, how, how your company makes money doing this. Um, what's, uh, what kind of business model are you pursuing with this? Is it a percentage of the fees that are collected? Is it, you know, just, just a little bit more on, on what's the model? Um, but uh, we really like the presentation. I, th I can see that there are some definite needs for especially certain types of services that could be bid out. Um, as a startup, um, that's a fantastic idea. Jolly? Yeah, I liked it. Uh, it was it was uh, it flowed very nicely. Um, um, I didn't get quite get the passion coming through or the energy, but maybe that's because you're an attorney and therefore you have to be more reserved. And you know, I don't know. Maybe that was part of it. But um, I mean, the thing that came to mind was you know some of the online legal services that exist today, Legal Zoom, and there's a whole you know plethora of them out there. So I wasn't really clear on the actual market that you're really going after. So. Um, so I think more definition there. And then also, you know, one thing when you're talking about your business, it's always helpful to indicate, you know, where are you with it right now? You know, is it a concept stage? Uh, you know, have you done an extensive business plan? Have you done uh, one of the things we always talk about in entrepreneurship and sort of early stages, you know, validating what you have. And so, 
uh, the, the idea of going after a lot, large number of customer discovery, going out talking to people who, and really define your market very clearly and use that to validate it will significantly enhance um, you know, your presentation. But again, it was, I think it was a very good job. David? Uh, very nice presentation. I think you did a great job kind of outlining the business and the concept and, and how it would work and uh, used some good examples. Uh, I, I agree with uh, my, my colleagues here. I, I had uh, similar notes in, in terms of what their comments were, so I won't, I won't repeat those. Um, I think one of the other things that would have been interesting to talk about is, is what the cost advantages might be to a client and, and why they would want to do this. And also, on the other hand, in terms of somebody using services, but also for lawyers selling services, exactly what kind of advantages they would have, whether it's more volume or how that would work. So a little bit more about the, the economic and business model to those people that are, that are interacting with your site. But uh, nice job. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Okay, so our final contestant is Mary Beckerman. And she did tell me the name of her company, and guess what? I've forgotten. But it's Omni something, isn't it? Yeah. Omni something. Omni Blue Channel. Okay, round of applause, please. Thank you, everyone. And before I get started, do not start with the four minutes. I just want to have a disclaimer that I've got a lot to cover. Four minutes goes by really fast, so I'm going to be reading from the script, but I do know my material, and let me start off if I may, okay? So I have to say there are three things that I've got a passion for in my life, and that is food, technology, and people, not necessarily in any order, all right? Throughout my varied career, I, sales and marketing has always been the core of who I have been, whether it was as an entrepreneur or working for a billion-dollar software company as where I actually was an IT sales executive and worked in four startup business units. In 2007, I left the software company and I became a chef. I became a raw food chef. I produced a DVD called Raw Fundamentals, had distribution to brick and mortar via national distributors, and created an e-book, an iBook, available through Amazon and the App Store. Drawing on my diverse experience as my passion for food and technology, I soon realized the opportunity in the marketplace for a cloud-based application that would be central repository for not only consumers, but for the professional chef industry, which would allow you to collect, manage menus and recipes, plus a host of many other functionality. So incorporating existing functionality that exists over disparate systems today, as well as new ones, such as incorporating from the e-cookbooks. Upon vetting my idea recently with professional chefs at the American Culinary Federation, I learned of an additional need, which there is a tremendous gap right now in the industry, and that is with the food supply chain. Much like the autos created the Covacent portal to purchase supplies from the auto tier suppliers, today a chef will spend anywhere between a half a day to a full day manually researching their food orders each week for, with their food distributors and suppliers. Do you see the inefficiencies here with margins being so slim in the food industry? Also, according to the Hartman Research Group, which is a leader in identifying consumer trends, reported the business growth with online grocery store remains the last consumer products that will go digital. There is today, according to um, Hartman, not one dominant source in the food marketplace, which is why I created the concept and own the URL to Omni Food Channel. As you can see from this um, little slide I have here, there's not one dominant player. There's over 18,000 food-related websites, over 35,000 food um, and cooking blog sites, over 90 different cooking shows, and over 120 major food, beverage, and cooking magazines. My vision is for the Omni Food Channel to become the dominant player in the food industry. Let me share some facts with you. All right, so in the food industry alone, this is a $1 trillion business. And that, if you consider restaurants, hospitality, um, hospitals and marketplaces, 
And then when you look at the digital publishing industry, a very new industry, which now is a $6 billion industry, and has experienced growth of over 110%. Every year, there are nearly 2,000 cookbooks being published every year. And with that being said, a lot of the old cookbooks are now finding their way into the e-digital book world. Okay? The entertainment industry, celebrity chefs, have changed the landscape, attracting younger audiences. And according to Bockers, the average age of a cookbook buyer is now shifting from 47 to 41. Health and wellness has gone mainstream, and the need for far smart uh, food solutions, solutions need to be created as consumers are struggling with, what do I eat? How do I eat? I am looking right now for a partner that will seed funding to take my concept to the next level to create a global class solution for the food marketplace. This will be um, really important for us to focus on the customer experience, which is a priority, and this is what CEOs and board members are looking at, number one today. Thank you. All right. Well. Gentlemen, Charlie, you can go first. Okay. Um, Mary, I uh, thought you did a very, very good job of uh, sort of getting the hook right in the beginning because, uh, um, I mean, right away you talked about food, you talked about tech. I'm in tech, I love to eat. So, I mean, you made that connection, I thought, very well. I thought as you went, began the presentation, uh, you really did a good job of establishing your own credentials, your background, sort of how it ties in. And then I thought that you reinforced that pretty well with kind of the figures you were using. Uh, so I think you sort of moved through the presentation uh, very well. I thought the way you used the slide was very good. You talked about the complexity and all the, the degree of things that exist there, and then you used the slide. I couldn't read what was on the slide. For all I know, it could have been ipso lorum execume. But, um, you know, I thought it, it, it made the point, which I think was the right thing. I like the way you talked about your vision in it. Um, I thought that, uh, you know, the big thing was you kind of established that you know what you're talking about, you have studied it, you really looked at it, um, you established the problem, I thought, very well, um, and the need that exists. Um, the only part that I found that you know, didn't follow through was I wasn't really clear on, you know, exactly what you were going to do, but the idea of a short presentation is not necessarily establishing everything, but now I, I'm thinking, well, how are you going to do this and what exactly are your next steps? So I think you accomplished that in the pitch very well. All right. Martin. Yeah, um, I... Uh I liked, I liked how it started off. Um, I would say that, you know, get away from um, reading, even though I, I know you, you said you knew the material. Um, just don't even bring the script up because, uh, I mean, it would, it would have been, I think, a lot better um, had you just been more natural in, in presenting in front of the group, which it seems like you can speak well anyway, so I would just not even bring it. Um, I... Um, I, I liked the data that you had at the beginning of the presentation. I guess I was, I'm still unclear on, on what this is, um, whether it is more uh, recipe-oriented or whether it's more uh, cookbook-oriented. So not that I need to know everything in, in the four-minute presentation, but a little bit more clarity on you know, what, what is it, what kind of content you're actually providing through this service um, and how you differentiate from competitive offerings, um, which I can understand are very fragmented, so um, the way you differentiate yourself would be a, a little bit uh, a little bit more information on that. David. Thank you, Mary. That uh, I think you did a, a nice job presenting, but I'm going to be a little more blunt than my, my colleagues here. I, I'm really not, nice one. not clear at all as to what you're selling, what the product is, really what it's all about. I think you kind of bounced around from food supply chain to recipes, you threw out a lot of facts. Um, I think what you really needed to do is, is right up front say, this is what I'm offering, this is what this is going to be, this is what it's about. Uh, I think it was great that you did some customer discovery, you talked to chefs, you talked to other people, you got some ideas, but still I'm, I'm, I'm at a loss as to uh, really what, what the business model is and uh, what you're going to uh, deliver to your customer. Fair enough. 
Okay, I'm slightly concerned that our board treasurer has just run off with the cookie jar full of money. Uh, <laughs> but, but hopefully he's just counting it with a view to giving it back at some point. Um, while our uh, noble judges um, use whatever farcical scoring mechanism we've come up for this, um, I need to thank two people. Um, firstly, I need to thank Mr. Stuart Nelson there. Uh, he kindly donated a sum of money for the prize. So thank you very much, Stewie. <laughs> and um, secondly, I really need to thank uh, Helen Ewing, one of our uh, board members, who actually did all the work that meant that I could just stand here and show off for half an hour. <laughs> all right. What have I got to do next? Have we got a result, gentlemen? We do. How do you want them? I don't know. Does one of you want to read it out, or shall I do it? Or what do you, what do you think? Why don't you give us a few minutes to compile them, and we'll... Uh... Okay. Yeah, questions from the audience. How about that? Who wants to go? Come on, don't be shy. Phil! Mary. Tell us. How do you envision making money from what it is you're selling? Because I, I have the same question. I was just... We said no hard questions, didn't we? <laughs> didn't think it's that hard. I think that, okay, so how, how do you make money? The key, as I said, is really customer intelligence. If you do your... Oh. The key right now is about attracting customers, growing your customer base... And that is number one priority right now in this industry. There's a lot of companies right now that are being bought up, that are losing money left and right. The key is if you can maintain or attract customers, gain loyalty, and expand your market share with customer intelligence, then you're doing the right thing. But, but who's your customer? Who's my customer? Consumers and profession, the professional market. So with... Consumers and chefs all maintain a, a, some type of recipes, menus. They do their management with it in terms of, um, you know, the yields and how, uh, how much they want to make, whether it's reducing the recipe size or increasing it for, you know, whatever event. Thereby, they now have to take it to the next level, and that is procuring the food. Okay. Okay? So the supply chain. So you've got online grocery stores that are growing You've got um, the need for a supply, supply chain in the, um, in the professional world linking to distributors and suppliers. And so um, there is going to be very many partners involved, um, enabling technologies, the marketplace, and the customer life cycle. So it's very key that a right strategy be placed to get to, in place. Yeah, still don't really know how, you, how you're going to make... All right, Bill, you've made your point. Sit down, shut up. Any more questions from the audience? Walk up to the mic or just yell them out. Peter. I'm still not sure what you're selling. What, how are you making money? What is, what is it that somebody buys? All right, Mary, come on. So my vision is for a cloud-based software solution. Okay, so... How is it going to be sold? It can either be free and or subscription-based. Okay? Does that answer your question? Do you want me to elaborate a little bit more on that? Yeah. What are you selling? What am I selling? I'm selling a solution that is going to be cloud-driven. Okay? That's going to be a software app that will manage and allow for procurement, so for I'm supplies. I'm a chef. What do I get from you? You would utilize Omni Food Channel, okay, to make your procurements and manage your recipes and menus as a starting point. Okay. Another question from the back there. Okay, so how clear is it on the problem? So, do a lot of food, do a lot of food, the pain is the manual time every week that's invested to make and track um, food purchases. So a half a day to a full day 
four hours to eight hours is a lot of time. So your solution is what to get rid of that pain? It will allow you to um, go online and be able to acquire um, knowledge as to which companies you want to procure your food and supplies and to manage your recipes. Time. Yeah, without a doubt, absolutely. All right. Okay, thank you. Any questions for any of the other contestants? Yes, come up. Sorry, I don't remember your name, the first one, the credit card shaver. There Save we go, it. right there. Um, one thing I was a little unclear on in your pitch was the actual benefit. So, you know, we heard, like, the, the feature and it being a larger blade, but I guess benefit-wise, like, how much time does that shave off my time it takes to shave? Or, you know, what's... Thank you. What's the, uh, and what's the benefit, you know, to keeping a shaver in my pocket if, for instance, I can't just whip it out and shave without, like, you know, lathering up or whatever, unless it somehow allows me to shave without, you know... Get it, giving myself razor burn. Like, what are the, the actual benefits of a credit card shaver, I guess, not just the features? The, the biggest benefit of the credit card shaver is that you can carry it in your wallet. You can't, you can't carry a regular razor or shaver everywhere you go. Um, everyone carries a wallet. Even ladies carry a small, tiny uh, makeup kit or anything like that. Your shaver goes with you wherever you go. Um, you go to work in the morning and the boss say, hey, we got a big meeting. And you, oh, I'm looking so scraggly. You run in the bathroom, you lather up, you shave, you come out, you're the new VP. That's just the way it is. The biggest benefit of my product is that you can carry it in your wallet. The second benefit is that it shaves probably anywhere from 40 to 50 seconds, um, I'm going to say per shave. In some cases, depending on how much hair you have, maybe up to a minute. Um, and as one of the judges said, I'm just of the mindset, everyone is in a hurry, everyone is you know, on the go, and if you cut off 10 seconds, you need those 10 seconds. Yes, sir. Hey, you're working the store the shaving cream. Okay, um, also we're working on shaving packs that you can actually carry in your wallet. And those will be uh, sealed, um, they won't bust, they won't tear open. But I just wanna say this, if worse comes to absolute worse, there are people who shave um, without shaving cream. You can use body wash, you can use soap, you can go in the restroom, you can use hand soap, you can use anything to shave with. You can use probably about 30% of the people actually shave dry, although 77% prefer a wet shave. But you can shave dry if worse came to worse. Yes, sir. Do you have any working prototypes, and if you use them? Yes. And, and the pro what, do you, what do you expect something like that would cost at retail? Um, this is an actual working prototype. Eastern Michigan University, um, one of the students made this prototype. They made me four. They are working models. Um, to start off with, I'm going to have three models. One is called a lean. Uh, second one is called a plush. They will be plastic. The third one is called a gold. Um, because I've learned that there are people who want the best of everything, no matter where you go in life. Also, they're going to start at manufacturing. Um, probably about the two, the two uh, beginning models will probably start between 50 cents and one dollar, and retail for between uh, three dollars and 350. Yes, sir. No, they are not flexible. Not at this time. Yes, sir. Well, everything is in the working stages. Um, this, this is, although it's an actual prototype, when we get into manufacturing, it's all about research and development, research and development. And my, my goal is to see what I can do to beat my competition. I've already beat them once already because I have what none of them have. Gillette is a $57 billion company. They don't have one. Schick is a $4 billion company. They don't have one. But when they see this one, they're going to make one. Because this one is going to make some money. And I've learned that companies love to follow suit. And so many people, they want the first big thing. 
They want to go down the street and say, hey, Bill, look what I got. I got the first one. You know, it's just the way it is. But that's not my goal. My focus is to get out there um, primarily to find a manufacturer and then secondarily to find um, and convince retailers that my product will complement their existing product lines. Because that's the biggest, that, that's one of the hardest things you have to do is convince them, hey, I have what you can use in your retail store. Yes, sir. Okay, now in the interest of fairness, because uh, two of the contestants have had a chance to do their pitch all over again, I think it's only fair <laughs> that somebody ask Diana a question. So come on. Diana, um, how do you expect to handle things such as prepaid legal services, which already covers low-cost legal services for individuals? Do you want this one or that one? Have this one. Are you, are you referring to how some tech startups will go to big law firms and they'll defer payment for a number of years until they've reached the profit? Uh, no, it was uh, more of the, the, the company Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> right. So um, we're a different model from that because those companies you pay a monthly subscription, but you, as a startup, you may only need a few legal services right off the right off the bat. So it wouldn't make sense to pay for a monthly subscription when you're only going to use it for one thing that month. Through Law Studio, you pay per transaction. So every time you need, you know, something, you need business formation, you need. Um, to get a copyright or a trademark or something like that, you can go on the website and it's transaction based. And so it's at your disposal whenever you know the need arises and you don't have to pay for something that you're not going to take advantage of. Yeah, so we're actually based out of Chicago, and um, at least in Chicago, the market there, you can easily pay five hundred dollars an hour for an attorney, and that's reasonable, right? To for that market, on our website, since the attorneys bid themselves on the services, it's you can get the lowest market rates, and it really varies from attorney to, to attorney. And a lot of these attorneys are either younger attorneys that, um, you know, really want to get more clients and diversify their client base, or they're more experienced attorneys that, you know, are just looking for a little more outside contract work to do outside of their 9 to 5 or more like 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. job. <laughs> okay, ladies and gentlemen, we have a winner. How shall I do this? Drum roll. Drum roll. Hey? Drum roll. Drum roll? Okay. Okay. And the winner of our first pitch pit is Diana Chen. Congratulations. Um, do, you, do, you want, do you want the best prize first, or would you like the second best prize first? <laughs> Okay, the second best prize is a certificate. <laughs> the first best prize is the princely sum of $218, uh, less Gary's commission, uh, le less my beer money, and less what you've got to pay in bribes to the judges. So I'll just keep it. No, here you go. 218 bucks. All right, and now the tricky bit. We decided that we were going to go for an audience choice award as well. So, all of those who agree with the judge's decision, please raise your hands. All right, who can count? Right, Mark, right you three, do some counting. I can't, I can't see a thing in this light. <laughs> All right. Who likes Xavier's razor?
some of you have voted twice already. Not as many. How about that? Finally, who likes Mary's recipes? Christ, nobody eats it, I don't know. <laughs> All right. Well, in that case, I believe we give the runner-up certificate in that case. And what do they win? The, they win a certificate for bragging rights. And that's as good as it gets. Where is it? Oh. All right. Yes. What should I do? Tell a joke? Jokes. No. Could you, could you like share how we came up with the... <laughs> <laughs> what do you, you think? There's no, some... Uh, no, 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 she, they, look, they look worried now, don't they? The first, <laughs> the first time you put them on the spot and give them a question like that, and they panic. Go on, Charlie. Well, you just, we're just ranking them, so you, you look, well, 10 would be closest to something very viable and looks like it really has potential, and one being, uh, don't quit, don't your, quit day your day job. job. So. You guys want a lawyer? I know where you can get one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so do, do you, want, you want the detailed scores then? No, no. It's um, essentially each of the judges were asked to mark out of 10. Um, so the, the scores were Diana won with a 18, which is an average of six, because I can do math. Um, Xavier was second with 16, so an average of five and a third. I'm good, no. Uh, and Mary scored 14, which is an average of four and two thirds. How about that? See? The advantage of an education before computers were invented. And indeed, abacuses. Um, all right, so Xavier, come up and get your uh, Pitch Pit Audience Favourite Award, which were lovingly created by <laughs> Helen. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay. Um, a few little uh, housekeeping items. Uh, firstly, judges, thank you very much for doing this. Um, you know, we ask a lot of you all the time, and it will carry on, so just suck it up. Um, presenters, thanks very much. Uh, it was great for you to come here and, um, you know, quite honestly, embarrass yourself in front of an audience of several. Um, and thank you, audience, for asking some nice questions and all that. If uh, any of you would like to do this, uh, we will be holding these events every other month at the New Enterprise Forum meeting, which is the third Thursday of each month at Ann Arbor Spark. Um, the prizes will be, again, Stuart will be uh, seeding the pot, and uh, depending on how many people we get through the door, we'll govern the size of the pot. Um, our next Pitch Pit competition will be on March 20th, so if you want to uh, apply for this, go to our website, which is uh, newenterpriseforum.org, and hopefully you can sign up from there. Uh, my final thing. Please read to your attendees before adjourning your bank breakout session. Okay. Many of you received a giving card from DonorsChoose.org. This card has an allotment of $10 for you to give to any educational program listed on the DonorsChoose.org site. Please find more about redeeming the cards before you leave. There will be volunteers at the registration desk to help you understand the process and the power your $10 can wield. So with that, thank you very much. <laughs>